All right, so welcome everybody. We absolutely enjoyed seeing everybody's projects this week. Um, again, my name is Aspen Meineke. We have Natasha Wilkerson on the call. As a reminder, next week we have a break, so we will not be doing a career chat next week, but uh, you can continue to work on your projects and can continue to submit on Goose Chase as well. So I love seeing everybody's robot hands this week. You guys were absolutely amazing. Um, and again, just keep submitting, keep getting those points for your team. And there's also the school prize as well, which we'll be giving out at the end. So again, just keep submitting and keep getting those prizes. All right. So I wanna welcome today our guest, Brian Murphy. He is a spaceship mechanical engineer and apprentice ISS chief engineer at Boeing. He has the coolest job title I think I've ever heard. His experience is that he's helped design NASA's space docking system and an exercise treadmill for the International Space Station. He is located in Houston, Texas, and he has a bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering from Texas A&M. So Brian, if you want to come on and turn your video on, welcome to Hello. the virtual stage today. <laughs> I'm so happy to be with you today. Yeah, yeah. Can you see my video? Yes. Perfect. All right. So before we jump into all the student questions today, I want to kind of go over the basics a little bit. So for our first question, if you can just tell the students a little bit about what is Boeing and what does it do? Sure. So Boeing is an engineering company. They build all kinds of airplanes and spaceships and satellites. They work on big projects and they have engineers all over the United States and all over the world. Yeah, I, I really didn't know that Boeing did stuff besides airplanes. And so when I was looking at the website to grab some of these pictures, I was shocked about how so much work that you guys do. It's really amazing. Actually, I didn't know either. I was at my college job fair and someone from Boeing came up and asked if I'd be interested in working on the space station. I was like, you guys do space stuff? <laughs> Yeah, that's so cool. Okay, and then my second question is, what is the Boeing Starliner? So this is something I've heard a lot about in the news and our students might've heard about it, but what is it exactly and what is its purpose? Sure, so the Boeing Starliner is a spaceship to take astronauts from Earth to the space station. So uh, a while ago, there was the space shuttle, which was really cool, uh, but it's also huge. It was used to help build the space station. It's giant compared to the Starliner. So we don't need to take up huge chunks anymore to build the space station, big pieces. We just need to take people. So Boeing and SpaceX both created these passenger vehicles to launch from Earth to space. Very cool. All right, so jumping into our student questions, this question is from Super Spacers in Oklahoma, and they're asking, what was it like helping create the NASA docking system that connects spaceships together? A super spacers, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it's kind of crazy to think about it, right? You have spaceship A, spaceship B, and they need to come together and not do that or that. They need to go, ah, click. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun and I learned a lot. Yeah, and going back to this picture over here, what is the size of this, the Starliner? The size of the Starliner. Um, so it's enough to seat five people. So okay. it's about like, maybe a minivan size. Oh, okay, wow, it looks huge. Yeah, compared to the, with the people there, it, you know, uh, part of what you're seeing is the base. I guess I'm talking about the okay. uppermost portion where the people sit. Uh, there is a lot more to it, uh, especially when you're getting up into space. Yeah, awesome, very cool. All right, our next question is, how do spaceships glide to each other for docking in space? Do the ah. spaceships use small boosters or magnets or both? And this is from Andromeda in New York. Andromeda, hey. So yeah, there's a lot of different ways you could build um, a docking system. What you want though is something that connects the ships together but also allows a port for the people to pass through, right? It wouldn't work for them just to stick together and then that's it. Uh, he got it, the people have to kind of go through like a tunnel. So. Um, to help them glide, that's part of the software or the astronaut that's controlling it, kind of like flying an airplane. Um, they, have, they have thrusters, once you're in there, kind of like the movies, to help align things, real cool like, and then they again. So if that animation plays again, 
you'll see uh, maybe some little latches. Um, mm -hmm. Can you start that one again? Oh, yeah. So if you've noticed how like a door latch works, how it has a part that clicks in, this, mm -hmm. well, this has a cone and then as it comes through kind of a circle path, it helps align it and then it's lined up and can go. And then it's kind of hard to see, but on each of those triangular sections, um, there's a latch like on a door that, that clicks in and then it's like, ah, we got it. Yeah. And how long did you work on this project for? So I worked on it for over three years, including, including the testing. And when we got to this point where, where it's showing the video, mm -hmm. um, that was really exciting for me because before then I had done the part on the right, which looks like a cartoon, but it's really our team using, using math and science to predict how it would work. And when it actually worked the way we predicted, we were very relieved. Yeah, and that segues into my next question perfectly. Are you worried that the docking system will fail or won't work? And this is from Yum Milky Way, very cool team name in Wisconsin. Cool, that's a great question. Um, I'll be nervous, you know, anytime it happens, but I'm not worried because for two reasons. One, we did a lot of testing and we did a lot of uh, math equations to show that it will work and when you're doing anything with humans going into space, you're careful to, to ensure there's secondary um, back, backup systems to make sure things are gonna work. So there's special procedures to do if it comes in and doesn't catch for some reason or kind of acts like it's gonna bounce off. So there's, that's good. It's very critical thinking you're doing there. That's great. Uh, but I'm not worried because we've, we've gone through those steps. All right. And when will the Starliner be launching to the ISS? Oh, Starliner should be launching later this summer. Oh, that's very or exciting. This, this flight will be without people, and then maybe by Christmas we'll have one with people. Yeah. So for all the students watching, make sure in the summer when y'all are on break, look at the news and see this thing launching a space that he worked on, which is so cool. All right, so we also know that you did a lot of work on the space station treadmill inside of the ISS. And so our first question is, what made you want to invent a treadmill for astronauts in space? And this uh, is from Mountaintop Awesome Knots in Colorado. Ooh, Awesome Knots, that's fantastic. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't like that. You're giving me too much credit, like, hey, I'm gonna invent this. Really what it was is I was kind of a new engineer and an engineer that had been there a while was like, Hey, would you like to help build a treadmill for astronauts? And I was like, okay. And so it was great. I got to help and I got to learn a lot. I didn't have the responsibility of kind of making sure everything would work. I had my little piece and I got to focus on my little piece. But I'll tell you, every time an astronaut goes up, they run on that treadmill and I feel great knowing that I'm helping them stay healthy. Because our bodies are really built to be here on earth with gravity. And when you're in space and you don't have gravity and you're, you're not using your legs very much and you're not getting that impact, it's not good for your bones. So astronauts have to do a lot of exercise. And these, these spaces here are all people that have used that treadmill and I, I just feel great that our team was able to help them. Yeah, what was the part that you worked on? So I worked on a part that helps, um, so I don't know if you've ever stood on like metal bleachers and you jump up and down and the whole bleachers shake or maybe you're in your car and you shake back and forth and the whole car shakes. Well, they don't want that to happen when people are running on a treadmill, right? Because you can imagine if you're just running on the floor, bang, 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 it's just, you're in like a big Coke can is what the space station <laughs> is. And so it would shake everything. So what I worked on was something called the vibration isolation system, which is a fancy word for some springs and things that help it kind of float and then they're running and then every now and then it'll bump, bump, but it's not like bam, 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 bam. All right, our next question is, when you created the NASA Space Station Exercise Treadmill, did you work as a team or individual from mm. the Chosen Ones in New Jersey? The Chosen Ones. Uh, so it was a team. I mentioned my mentor that, that asked me to join in, but there were a lot of us. Uh, I think even within my little team, there were five of us, and then there were others that did other parts. So it was dozens, maybe over 100 people that worked on all the different parts because this Treadmill requires power. It requires those, the, the white things on the side are bungees to help hold them down. Because in space, if you just push on something with your foot, you'll just 
ah, float away, which is fun, but isn't much exercise. So it was a, a big team effort. Yeah, about how many people do you know that worked on it? So yeah, I think working closely on it, it was probably two dozen. And then overall, there's people that are specifically working to make sure the astronauts are healthy. So those people were asking us questions, making sure, you know, everything was that, that astronauts were going to get a work, good workout, you know, probably over 100 people altogether. The space station or anything with human spaceflight requires a lot of different disciplines, a lot of specialties. So you may work in one part, but you get to work with people that do all kinds of other things. Yeah. All right. And then how long did it take you to come up with the final design for the treadmill from Space Cadets in Mississippi? Hey, Space Cadets. I think um, it was probably about three years. Uh, NASA gave us a timeline. They said, you know, we want it ready by this time. We want it to be this big. We can't weigh more than this much. It was a lot of, you know, we call those constraints, design constraints. You guys may know about those from some things you've done. Um, and it was tough to get something to work. So we did uh, a lot of trial and error and had a lot of different ideas. And we did that in, you know, using, using math. We did all the trial and error before we ever got a piece of hardware, before we ever built anything physically, uh, using the same stuff you guys are learning, using your science and math. Okay, right, cool. All right, from the superstars in Wisconsin, what kinds of problems do you run into when designing something that's going in space and how do you get around them? Good question, superstars. So space has a lot of unique challenges. Um, it's, it's very hot if the sun's shining on you and it can be very cold if you're in the shadow. We're on the earth and it keeps things more mild. Even when it's super cold or super hot here, space is more extreme. Um, other things like radiation. You know, if you go outside too long with no sunscreen, you'll get sunburn. That's from some radiation from the sun. Well, our atmosphere makes that nicer for us. And if you're in space, there's no atmosphere. So you have to be sure, you know, whatever you're building is going to be safe for the astronauts. So those are, those are a few things that are challenges. There's so lots of gravity. Oh, absolutely. All right. So when testing, was there a time something didn't work from Galaxy Girls in Minnesota? Hey, Galaxy Girls. Yes. Uh, so we mentioned the docking system test, right? And I was all excited when it worked. <laughs> well, at the beginning, it didn't work. And we were scratching our heads, what's going on? In that case, we found out it wasn't our docking system. It was the place we went to to conduct the test. They had a little problem. But, you know, we were like, oh, no, what did we do wrong? What's going on? So we're looking through things. Uh, but then also, like with the treadmill, you know, there's things we tried and didn't work. And so we're like, let's try something else. So, you know, that's normal to try something. It doesn't work. You got to rethink it and try again. And you try to try to do those things, you know, before you actually have the thing made or the whole thing. Maybe you'll do an example or something like that. Um, the things pictured there are things that me and my friends built just for fun, actually models and things, and those all use um, computer code running on something like Arduino. I don't know if you guys have heard of that or scratch coding or any kind of coding. Heard you're doing some kind of robotics, that's awesome. But a lot of times when you're start starting something like that, it doesn't work the way you think it should or that you want it to, and you're like, why isn't that working? And so you debug, right? You're like, what's wrong? Let's try this again. So that's pretty normal, <laughs> even when you're an engineer. Yeah, I think that's the hardest part to get used to with the engineering design process is not that not everything is going to go perfectly the first time. There's no like perfect formula to it. And you got to really try and uh, do different types of methods to see really what works best. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true. All right. This question is from New Hall Space Eagles in California. So they have two questions. Why did you decide to be the chief mechanical engineer? And what were your goal, the goals you set for yourself at the beginning of your career? Okay, Space Eagles. Uh, so the chief engineer thing, kind of like working on the treadmill, wasn't something I asked for. Someone said, hey, would you like to try this? And so I said, okay, I'll try it out. So that's why I'm an apprentice chief engineer. It's because I'm learning the things. I'm not, I'm not in charge. Uh, but I get to see what they're doing and they're mentoring me. They're giving, 
their time to help me to learn, much like your teachers give all of their time to help you guys learn. It's not like you graduate college um, and you're done learning. No, no, that goes on forever. And um, it's great, it's great. And now in terms of goals, I think that's a goal I set when I started as an engineer and it's still my goal now is to remember that I'm still learning, to not get too down on myself if something doesn't go well. And also remember not to get too comfortable in what I'm doing. I wanna learn new things. There's so many incredible, exciting things in our universe and let's keep learning. Yeah, and really quick for the students listening, if they're wanting to do a job someday similar to what you do, what advice would you give them? Oh, okay. So stay curious. And when things don't work, when it's hard, math or reading or your science fair project or whatever it is, don't give up. Don't think, oh, this isn't for me. When I started college, my first year was really hard. I didn't know how to study yet. And it was tough. And I was like, I don't know if I should do this. But people encouraged me and I stayed and I did better and better. So know that you're going to have challenges, if not in school somewhere, but keep at it, keep trying and know that that's normal to struggle along the way, but worth it. Yeah, I love that. That's great advice. All right, so we are going to talk about a subject that we got a lot of questions on from the students. And so before we go to that slide, I just want to have a disclaimer that for what we are about to talk about, students, you are not supposed to try this at home. Do not try to do this on your own. This is for professionals like Brian Murphy only. So the juggling flaming torches. <laughs> Um, how, really quick, how did you get into this? Like, how, how did this get started for you? Yeah, actually, it was from when I was in school. We had a guest speaker come, a juggler, and he said, you know, he told us not to do drugs and how it's bad for us. And a, a friend and I, neither of us have done drugs, but we did get addicted to juggling. And so we decided, hey, we're going to learn to do this. We have no idea how. We don't know anybody that juggles but let's, let's try. And so we just spent like over a year learning how. That's so cool. All right, so jumping into the questions we've got, um, Nebula Nova from New York wants to know what safety precautions are needed when juggling flaming torches? Mm, Nebula, cool. Uh, yes, so what you can't see is I've got a fire extinguisher near me on the ground in that video. So also it had rained just before this and I'm juggling over concrete next to a brick building. So I'm not near anything that can burn. I mean, it kind of looks like the plant where the, the place that behind me is close, they're, they're pretty far back. So um, that's how you'd be safe. Yeah. All right, and our next question from Triton's tribe in New Jersey is, did you ever get burned or burn something else while juggling flaming torches? And can you please give us a demo? <laughs> uh, I've had a minor burn. Um, you know, especially when it's dark, it's hard to see. And really all you see is the burny part, which is the part you don't want to grab. Uh, but since you know we're doing it, you know, like, if I feel something hot, I'm going to let go. So I've never had, like, you know, a burn that needed more than a Band-Aid. Demo. Not, I'm not going to light fire in my house, but I'll show you. Okay, so these are the torches, and um, these I made back when my friend and I were learning, but we didn't start here. You can't start there. So we started with just bean bags, right? And so these are great because if you drop one, it doesn't roll away, uh, it's, it's right there. If you wanna learn yourself, advice I got would stand right against your bed. So then when they drop, uh, you can get them. Because the best way to learn to juggle is to drop them 10,000 times. Because after 10,000 times, you will have learned how to juggle. And in that way, it's much like learning math or learning a type of science or becoming an engineer, it just takes work. It's normal for people to drop, drop, whatever and whatever they're working on. So we did these and we moved to these. This was quite a bit harder. I'm gonna make some room so I don't take out my laptop. All right, you see me? So these, um, 
there was a question about getting burned. That's not bad. These actually are really hard. And for some reason, when I throw them, they want to hit me right there, right? The bone right under your eye. And that's, that's really not very fun. And that uh, hurts quite a bit. All right, we'll see if I can still do this. Okay, I think I'll try again. That was so awesome. I cannot juggle. I could, I haven't even tried, but I know I can't. <laughs> oh, awesome. It's 10,000 attempts and you'll have it. All right. Yep. So for students, if there's anything you want to try 10,000 times and you can get it. There you go. All right. So now we're going to jump into our rapid fire question. So I know you can handle flaming torches, but can you handle the rapid fire questions? I've got a phone call. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> All right, so the rule here is you got 10 seconds to answer each question. Um, the first thing that comes to your mind, whatever is first thought that comes to your head is your answer. All right, are you ready? Maybe. All right, the first question, which is harder, juggling flaming torches or creating the docking system? Ooh, trick question. For both, you have to keep trying until you get it. Next. All right, what is your favorite place to kayak? Um, anything that can, I can put a kayak in is going to be nice because it's going to be a lake, a pond, something. There's going to be nature all around. Nice. How often do you go mountain climbing? Not nearly enough. I live in Houston, Texas, which is totally flat. So <laughs> it's a while to go. So, uh, but I'll go on hikes, you know, at least I like camping and such. So as often as I can. Yeah. All right. What was your favorite part of going to South Korea? Oh, yeah. Well, the food was amazing. Delicious. Uh, there's so much culture there. Um, you know, and then I got to meet other students at the university. And so that was a lot of fun just talking with them. The best part, the best part was the people meeting other people. Awesome. And then last but not least, where do you see yourself in five years? Has someone been talking to my boss? What's <laughs> that about? Five years. Uh, I want to... Then my primary goal is always keep learning, stay curious, and that's pretty much it. I love engineering. I've got no reason to leave. And I, while I wasn't trying to get into space engineering, like, you know, even when I was in college, I never even thought about it. I thought, I'm not sure what I thought I would do, but I love it. It's so fun and there's so much more to do. So five more years, I hope I'm helping us do things on the moon. Yeah, I think that's so important what you mentioned is to love what you do, you know. Yes. So does oh. that mean that you don't want to be an astronaut? Uh, I think my wife would comment on if I left her on this planet with our kids without me. Um, I don't know. You know, so much of the work, almost all the work is done by people that are not astronauts. Astronauts are amazing. I'm still a fan. You know, I had a Ann McLean sign my space shuttle and I'm still, you know, I'm not going to let this thing go because, you know, she's an astronaut. She was in one of those photos. And I think they're amazing, but, you know, the vast majority of people doing space stuff are not astronauts. So you don't need to do that. There's lots you can do from, from, from here on Earth. And so I had one question from a student that's watching live. They want to know, how did it feel when you first did something at NASA from Elon? Good question. Uh, when I first started at work, I had, you know, you guys hear about imposter syndrome. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Why did they hire me? I mean, I went through college, but I really don't know. And which that was me realizing, you keep learning. You know, you learn these things, you learn these, the math and the science and things, and then you get to your job and they train you to do what you need to do there. Uh, so my first thing was, but then also I was really excited. I got my NASA badge, you know, I'm going to Johnson Space Center. Like, wow, this is cool. Um, so a mix of uh, fear and excitement. What is the badge that's behind you? Uh, unrelated. This is from Comet Kalooza, which is a, so we love the, those things you saw, the photos with all the LEDs. I love Making, even when I'm not at work, here's a 3D printed Yoda. That's the lights all here on my side. I promise it's 
Um, and we get to show things like that and try to do hands-on STEM stuff with the public because it's great. You guys are really lucky to be part of Space Club and get to do these fun things. Not everybody gets that. So I'm excited for you. I love all that kind of stuff. So that, that's what that was from though, when we were exhibiting some things there. And then there's like Chewbacca walking by, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's so fun. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for joining us today. Um, you know, it was so fun to hear your background, but also like the fun things that you do outside of work to show that, you know, engineers aren't just at the computer all day and don't have this other life. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Kind of giving the students a balanced perspective. And I would invite you to stay on because I'm about to show some highlights sure. from what the students have been working on. Okay, so let's move to the so, next part. Um, first, apologies for some glitches there on the PowerPoint. I know it looked a little blurry. Um, we'll send you guys the recording afterwards, so don't worry. Um, you can hear everything Brian had to say. And so let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. So we always start here with some project highlights. And this past week, you guys were working on a welcome tower. And so your goal was to light up a sign for your base on the moon. But the trick, you either use a solar panel or coin cell battery, but you had to create a circuit with a switch. And this is when the challenges start getting harder. Um, so I was very impressed with the materials you used, how you created these different designs. Um, so let's go ahead and watch. What do you think, Brian? That was amazing. Wow, I didn't realize you guys were addicted to LEDs too. Such cool projects. I, I, that was awesome. Yeah, I was very impressed. And now we're going to move to the raffle. But I'm excited for the project you guys are working on this week and next week, which is this robot hand. Brian, you mentioned robotics. Yeah. And so the students are working on a paper robotic hand, but it has string and straws, and they're trying to actually grab something to mimic like a robotic arm on the ISS. Awesome. So I will have to share that with you. Okay, awesome. now the part everybody's waiting for, right? So raffle prizes. Um, every week we give out a new prize based on your goose chase questions. Um, so it's always something different. And like Aspen mentioned, we have the big school prize at the end. 25,000 points gets you into that raffle. And I saw, I just checked the leaderboard. There's some teams at 21,000, so you're getting close. So keep, keep going. Okay, 
this time, instead of showing you uh, the product, I'm going to show you a video of what you can do if you win. All right, so this prize is the Makey Makey. Have you heard of it, Brian? Yes, I have one and it's awesome. It can be a little finicky, so keep at it if you get it and keep trying. I yeah, but- the, 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 Let me back that up. The banana piano was our favorite. Ooh, I'm really excited about the stairs. That's what I've always wanted to do, our musical stairs as you go up. That. That's my dream. So if you have a Makey Makey, you can make your own musical stairs or banana piano or Play-Doh controller, and you can actually pair this with uh, Scratch or any like online video game uh, coding. And so it's really awesome. Our Space Club students in San Antonio have used these. So I'm excited for the team that wins. And so the way we do this round, I'm gonna stop sharing here. And now I'm gonna pick, do our picker wheel. So Brian, just so you know, this is random, okay? So we are not biased here. <laughs> and the, I have all the teams that completed that Welcome Tower mission and all the questions on Goose Chase. And we have one team that's gonna win. And so if I could get a drum roll and we are gonna go ahead and spin. Congratulations, Riverview Elementary Team Bucks. You are the winners. So for this week, you are going to get the Makey Makey. Each one of you on the team is going to get it. That concludes our Space Club career chats. Uh, thank you for joining us again, Brian. So happy I was able to join you. This is so cool. Yeah, we had fun today. And I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. And we'll see you back in a week in, or in two weeks. Not next week, but the week after. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.